Lord, we thank you that you love us, and we thank you that you care. And Lord, I pray that as we dive into your word that you would speak to us. Lord, as we look at some of these very familiar passages, Lord, just tear down the walls of our hearts. Lord, we, we acknowledge that without you, we can do nothing. So Lord, I pray that we would abide. Lord, that we would stick to you. Lord, that we would stay with you in all things. And Lord, we would do that by prayer, by reading your word, by spending time with you. Lord, by singing to you with worship, with songs. Lord, by going into creation and just being with you. All these different areas, Lord, I pray that we could know you more. And Lord, may these be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Around Christmas time, my parents would set up a nativity scene. And we would do uh, this scene in the front yard, and it kind of grew every year, and it became a thing for us. And so we, as a family, we would set it up around Thanksgiving time, and we would, you know, add lights and all sorts of fun stuff. Well, one year, unfortunately, somebody decided to steal baby Jesus and I was like, who? And it, baby Jesus was a little doll. There wasn't a real baby, obviously, but it was just a little doll. And it, we woke up one morning and Jesus was gone. And so we thought, oh no. So we, we were riding our bikes all over the neighborhood trying to find out where baby Jesus was. And we finally found him in the neighborhood across the way. And it was really sad. I'm sorry for laughing. It's it's probably not reverent, but it was really sad. But baby Jesus was in somebody else's front yard. And in Tucson, there's a bunch of gravel everywhere. There's not a lot of grass, right? They, we didn't really know what that was. But Jesus was just face down in the dirt with no diaper on. They took the diaper off and, and he was just like down there. And, that, and we found baby Jesus that way. And I want to give you guys a picture of the passage that we're going to talk about today. Imagine that you are Jesus's mom and dad. So you've seen a lot. You've seen angels, you've seen uh, shepherds and, and wise men and a lot of stuff that God has done. Joseph has given, been given dreams, all the things. And you go to Jerusalem once a year as, as a good Jewish family would do. And this one year you go on vacation, go to Jerusalem. And then in the midst of it all, you lose Jesus. So they were at Jerusalem and they would go and they would present sacrifices and, and they, would, they would do all of that. And so there was a, oh, sorry, just a few, few verses earlier. So verse 25, they go to make sacrifices and dedicate the baby uh, Jesus. And so it catches somebody's attention. Verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, in verse 27, the Holy Spirit tells Simeon to go to the temple. And so he, he goes to the temple and Simeon sees the young baby and baby Jesus. And he's like, this is it. God confers to him that this is the baby that's going to be the hero of mankind. And so Simeon blesses God and says, verse 29, now Lord, now let your... Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for people for, your, and for glory for your people Israel. Now who are the Gentiles? They're non-Jewish people. Now Jesus is for Jews and non-Jews alike, which is awesome. And Jesus is for everyone. And Jesus shines a light on how we can come to God. This is through Christ himself and also the glory of Israel. So it's for the Jews, but it's also for the Gentiles. The, the Old Testament makes it very clear that the Messiah would be for everyone. Now verse 33, And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child appointed has, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So yes, Jesus for everyone, and his message, unfortunately, divides people. There's, it's predicted that Jesus will be for the rise and fall of many in Israel. Some will come to faith, some won't. And, little side note, this is going to be hard for Mary. So it's the, idea, it's the 
metaphor of a sword piercing her own soul. The reason it's going to be hard for Mary is because fast forward to the end of book of Luke, Mary is going to watch her son die on a cross to pay for the sins of mankind, to, to, to do that for all of us. And that is going to be gut-wrenching. And so Simeon gives Mary some encouragement. Mary, this is going to happen. It's going to pierce your soul. It's going to be heartbreaking. It's going to be gut-wrenching. It's going to be sad. But here's the good news, Mary. It's going to be worth it. Your son is going to save people from death, hell, and destruction. And so Jesus, is, that's his mission. That's what he's going to do. In verses 36 through 40, just to summarize, there's another uh, prophetess that comes up by the name of Anna, and a prophetess, a prophet, they would relay messages from God to other people. And she sees, again, she, she was in the temple the whole time. She didn't, she didn't depart. She was praying all the time. And then she sees Mary and Joseph, and she has a message for them as well. And verses 39 through 40, they fulfill all the Jewish law requirements uh, for, for Jesus. And he grows up and he's wise and he's got God's favor upon him. So he's a good, he's a good guy. But he's more than just a good guy, as we're going to find out later. And so what we see here is that God uses these random people to encourage Mary and Joseph. Now Mary and Joseph, they were, they've, they've seen a lot. They've gone through a lot. But these other people, uh, Simeon and Anna, they were a little on the older side. And just a side note, this is just encouraging that God can use anyone. Whether you're young, old, or in everything in between, long you have a, as long as you have a willing heart, God can use you. God can see you used and see, and see you use your gifts and talents for him. Now, fast forward about 12 years, and you have Mary and Joseph going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. It's a long journey. It's about 90 or so miles, and it's on foot. And the Jews would make this pilgrimage every year to remember what God had done for them to free them from the land of Egypt. So they have a great Passover, and then here's what happens. Verse 43, And when the feast has ended, and as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents did not know it. And but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was God. Mary and Joseph knew this. So this is what this means. This is what's going through their minds. They literally lost God. Literally. Like Jesus stays back in Jerusalem they assume, oh, he's probably with the other group. He's probably with the other group because men and women would travel differently. That's not unsurprising. But then they find out, he's not with you. I thought he was you. <gasps> Uh-oh, they lost God. It's like, no, this is, this is bad. If you're a mom or dad, I freak out when I lose my kids for two minutes in the store, much less a whole day. This is, this is, bi- this is bad, <laughs> right? To, to lose the, the savior of mankind. So they go back. To Jerusalem, so it's been you know a day's journey out, so a day's journey back. So now it's been two days, and then they still look for him in the city. They can't find him. Verse forty-six. So after three days, they find him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. This means that Jesus, this twelve-year-old boy, has been behi- he's been by himself in Jerusalem, a big city. He's not from the big city. He's in the he's in the the, the farm area, way out in the middle of nowhere, Nazareth, for three days. Can you imagine dropping your 12-year-old son or daughter in the middle of downtown Boise for three days? Yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is not good. Like you, as a parent, I would be totally freaking out. Kind of gives me, I don't know, trigger. I don't know. It's, it, I don't like it, right? But here we go, verse 47. And all who heard Jesus were amazed at his understanding and his answers. This 12-year-old boy who has had no education and has had very little experience was asking questions and providing answers that people that had all the education and had all the experience struggled to answer. And I'm sure they, the, the pastors or rabbis, we call rabbis and different people at the time, they thought that this guy, Jesus, was a prodigy. There's a reason he knows so much, 
And it's because he's God in, excuse me, he's God in human form. Now, do you, this is kind of a funny thought, do I think that Jesus came out of the womb just perfect? He's like, well, thank you, mother. That was a wonderful experience. It's like, no, like, Jesus was a baby. He put on flesh, became one of us. I do believe that as time went on, he was different from the other children simply because of who he is. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. But it, and I don't know, like this is just my personal opinion, so, so, so don't quote me on this. But I don't think Jesus knew everything about him right out the gate. I think he had to discover, in a sense, who he was. His physical mind had to catch up to his eternal existence. And I don't know what that moment looked like for Jesus, but you can see glimpses of it here. I don't know if it was just, a, just something that he said or just... Or, or something that he did. I, I don't know. But somewhere along the line, Jesus realized, this is who I am. I am the Messiah. Because you know his parents told him all the stories and told him what was happening. In verses 48, his parents didn't know what to think. And, and son, his mother said to him, like, could you imagine the tone? Like, that's mom tone. Son, like, why did you do it? You can just hear it uh, through the text. Why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. <laughs> and you can, I mean, she's, she's seemingly justified in that. But look at how Jesus responds, verse 49. Why did you need to search? Jesus asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? These are the first recorded words of Jesus as a human. Now, Jesus knew about his special birth. He had that special connection to God because obviously Mary Joseph told him all the stories because let's think about it. Who is Jesus' real dad? Well, God. It's God the Father. And so where is God's house or where God specially resides? Well, it's the temple. That's what it says in the, in the Old Testament. And Jesus basically says the following. If you lost me, why didn't you look in the obvious place? That's a good question. Obviously, I would be here at the temple. Obviously, I would be at God's house. Where else would I be? You, you were there at this, for the angels. You were there for the shepherds. You were there for the wise men. Verse 50, but they didn't understand what he meant. They're like, oh, okay, Jesus. I, I don't, we don't get it, but, but okay. Now, Mary and Joseph, um, they confused. And what I find amazing is that this 12 to 13 year old Jewish boy, um, they would start apprenticing around this age. And it's interesting to me that when Jesus references his father's house, yeah, I'm sure that he would be apprenticing under Joseph, his earthly father, but I think he was beginning a heavenly apprenticeship with his heavenly father. Where God is starting to speak to Jesus and to show him uh, the trade, Jesus was learning from God the Father. He had a special connection because of his deity. And the fact that Jesus knew so much that he amazed the professionals of the day, you start to see how that, how that makes sense. I'm going to pick this up. Sorry. You can start to see like, how that makes sense. Now, verse 51. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother stored all these things in her heart. Kids, students, I'm just here to tell you, Jesus was God, and he still listened to his mom and dad, who were clearly inferior, but he still submitted to them, because that's what the scriptures tell us to do. Now, you might think, hey, uh, Scott, uh, my parents are crazy, or what are you saying? Like, that, that's a different discussion, that's a counseling session for another time. But kids, like God wants you to submit to your parents. It demonstrates that you understand authority. It demonstrates that, that you can submit to God. Because if you can submit to your parents, you can submit to God, who is the greater authority than, than our parents. I love the phrase, Jesus, Jesus' mom stored all these things in her heart. She's just soaking it in. Just, just all these things and all these stories, she's just soaking all of it in. And all these adventures of faith. Verse 52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God 
and all the people. So Jesus grows up and he's wise. He's generally liked by the people around him. And most importantly, God approves of Jesus. Now, when we look at a passage like this, and you might think, Scott, I don't know how this relates to me today. Uh, I'm not Mary. I'm not Joseph. I don't have a virgin born son. Like, how does this, how does this apply to me today? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's the timeless principle. Mary and Joseph were frantically searching for God, but they weren't searching in the right place. They looked everywhere else except the temple. And, they, and here's the thing, they didn't search in the obvious place either. The temple kind of was the obvious place. Remember the parents, and let's just recount their history. Mary was visited by an angel more than once, virgin birth. She had the face to see it through. And she was brave enough to see uh, God's mission for her, even as a teenager. Joseph has at least four visitations by angels directing him by God to accept Mary, to, even though it looks bad, to, to still go through with the marriage, to accept Jesus as his own, to escape Herod and to save Jesus from being killed. And it was these two people that had amazing spiritual experiences with God, probably as teenagers, somehow along the way as they got older, they lost God and they forgot to look in the obvious place for God. Spiritual experiences do not guarantee present faithfulness. Spiritual experiences do not guarantee that you are going to continue to follow God. Now, I'm not anti-spiritual experiences. Please, please hear me in this. God gives us those experiences and those things to encourage us and to help us move forward. But we follow a person, not a, not a high. We follow Jesus, not an experience. Jesus gives us these things to, to give us direction and to show us where to go and what to do, but it is our relationship with Jesus, talking to him and reading his word and, and being with him. It is our relationship with Christ that guarantees whether we're going to continue in the faith or not. And so, Christian, I'm here to lovingly challenge you. Do not rely on spiritual experiences to keep you in the faith. Rely on Jesus to keep you in the faith. Yes, they're important. They're, they're valid. They're part of what God is doing in your life. But Jesus is the one that will keep you in the faith. And so, Christian or even though if you're an unbeliever here or in person online. Christian, are you looking for God in the right place? For those of you that aren't a Christian, are, are you looking for spirituality in the right place? Are you looking for God in the obvious place? You know what the obvious place for looking for God is? Here. It's in his word. It's at church with other Christians and I would just encourage you, Christian, that if you have been looking for solutions and you've been looking for, for God to do something for you and you've been looking in all the wrong places except the obvious place, which is here, which is in prayer, which is amongst us all here at church, God is waiting. God loves you. He wants to share truth with you. He wants to give you direction. He wants to give you guidance. My prayer is that you would see that, Christian. That you would see that God loves you and it's just time to look for him in the right places. My personal devotion, I was in Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 3, chapter 22, it says this, Return, O faithless sons, and I will heal your faithlessness. Finding God is simply about coming to him, no strings attached. But I'll be honest. Sometimes I feel like I come back to him and then, and, then I, and then I fall away again. And then I come back and then I fall away and then I come back and fall away. Just a, I, I don't know, maybe this resonates with you, but sometimes I find my heart just wanders, spiritually speaking. It just wanders around. And this verse really spoke to me. God says, I will heal that wandering. I will heal that faithlessness. You simply need to continue to return to me. 
Some of us get tired of coming back to God. But that's what we need. Because that's the obvious thing to do. And the right place is to be with the Lord. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're an unbeliever, either here in person or online, God is here with you. And your search is over. God wants you to believe in him. God wants you to trust in him. God wants you to follow him. And God wants to be God of your life. God wants your life to be changed and to be transformed. And if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. Jesus wants us to follow him, but we first have to accept what Jesus did for us on the cross. We have to accept that forgiveness. Because of all the things that we've done wrong and all the, and all the sin, Jesus wants to forgive us because he loves us. And so if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. So let's all pray. Let's go before the Lord. Lord, I pray, whether for those that are here or online, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, I pray that we'd look for you in the right places, in your word, at church, the obvious places. Lord, that our search would be over. For those that don't believe in you, Lord, I pray you would give them boldness to take the next step. And if that's you, and you want to give your life to Jesus where you want to ask him to forgive you of your sins, you want to trust in him for that, of what he did on the cross. You want to believe that he rose again on the third day and that he is going to be God of your life. Where you're going to continue to follow him. We don't, we don't follow God to be saved. We follow God because he has saved us. So if that's you, I simply want you to, to just raise your hands Lord, to, to receive Jesus. And if that's you, just simply do that now between you and the Lord. And for those of you online, you can do that too. Wherever you are, if you're on the bus or wherever you are, you can do that. So simply raise your hands. Awesome. Lord, you see your children's hands that are raised. I pray that they would follow you all of their days. Lord, that they are spiritually made new. They no longer have to fear death, hell, and destruction. Lord, that you would continue to move in their life. And Lord, praise God that they have found the right thing, and that's in you, Christ, and their search is over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.